I must now call upon the Hunterian or the Oslerian orator of 1962, Dr. Bett, whose oration is entitled The Epitaph of Adrian's Horse. It has a subtitle which reads, This Should Keep You Guessing. Dr. Bett. Actions speak louder than words. To show my appreciation of the great honor you've done me in asking me to deliver the Oslerian oration, I shall perform the supreme sacrifice. I shall refrain from smoking while I'm on my feet this evening. <laughs> Let's talk of graves of worms and epitaphs, make dust our paper, and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. I must apologize for so lugubrious an introductory note. It's my sciatica. <laughs> if a guest was so inconsiderate as to die, while occupying a bedroom at the old Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo, they would nonchalantly remove the corpse wrapped up in a Persian carpet, and not one of the residents was aware that death had come and gone. This not entirely apocryphal lesson in discretion may well serve as an example to those addicted to what Wilfred Trotter called the highly respectable, if somewhat sedentary, occupation of commemorating the departed great. Ironically, it isn't only lovers who cannot see the pretty follies that themselves commit. How often does not the air of caricature corrupt the pathetic attempt of the sainted sage to make a specific memorial of a hero's least heroic achievement. Paradoxically, the great Vesalius, whose signatures writ large across every page of the Book of Anatomy, has found an eponymic grave that can neither praise nor celebrate him in an incredibly insignificant structure, the foramen Vesalii, a small venous opening just anterior and medial to the foramen ovale. His subsequent discovery of the os Vesalii, the occasionally separate tuberosity of the fifth of base of the fifth metatarsal bone, reminds me of Dr. Johnson's description of a second marriage immediately after an unhappy first one as a triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> Some people are born for immortality. It is a tragedy that their eponyms die hard. Paradoxically, Sir John Bland Sutton who made so many heroic changes in the art and the science of surgery, gave his large kingdom for a little grave, a little, little grave, an obscure grave. In the house of eponymous epitaphs, he lives in the basement. A tiny frog, Hyla Blansatoni, has made him immortal with its croak. Be that as it may, Sir John had no illusions about the casualness of memorial piety, as witness this not entirely apocryphal story. It was rather early in the morning when he was showing some visitors around the Institute of Pathology at the Middlesex Hospital, 
and the only other people on the scene were the charwomen, one of whom had irreverently draped her duster over the marble bust of the Institute's donor. Turning to his friends, Bland Sutton exclaimed, That's what they do to me while I'm still alive. And, paraphrasing Sir Thomas Brown, which of course explains a multitude of sins, paraphrasing Sir Thomas Brown, and when I'm dead, they'll piss on me. <laughs> Mr. President, <coughs> Your Excellency, my Lord, friends of and in the Osler Club. The 25th Oslerian oration, which I have the single honor to deliver this evening at the 198th meeting of the Osler Club, was commemorates a birthday since which 113 years have now passed. The oration was conceived by two medical students in their salad days, green in judgment, yet in their fervor adding another hue unto the rainbow. Thirty-four years ago, the Chinese have a saying that it is only when you reach the age of 50 that you are able to appreciate the mistakes you made at the age of 49. <laughs> The scene was a bedroom at the Golden Cross Hotel in the city of lost causes and forsaken beliefs and impossible loyalties. No plaque over its gateway commemorates this happy event. I cast my bread upon the waters, perhaps Carly Lyon may find it after many days. <laughs> Having listened to Harveyan and Hunterian orations, these two students <coughs> had come to associate the term oration <coughs> not too extravagantly, perhaps, with academic pomposity and the boredom of repetition. And the term orator not too extravagantly, perhaps, with some nester of the profession whom God sends walnuts when he no longer has teeth to crack them. <laughs> there are no Harvian orators here tonight. Uh, you never give the Hunterian oration. Mm -hmm. Now, in those days... In those days, Alfred Franklin and I thought alike. Those were the Elysian days. For he had not yet been uh, taxidermified, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of London. In fact, <coughs> he was quite human then. He used to smoke and enjoy an occasional cigarette to say nothing of other vices, such as episodic affairs with, I cannot remember her name, <laughs> perhaps so renowned a classical scholar as Viscount Solbury may be able to help me out. She was a tense muse, the muse of jazz. But you can forget all that. Now, we were determined that our brainchild, our oration, should be different. And what proud fathers don't want their child to be different. And we decided that our oration should be spelled with a small O. <coughs> and ever since, the Oslerian oration has been quickened by a spirit of familial intimacy which has defied and defeated grandiloquence and grandiosity. The Oslerian orators have been leeches and librarians, physiologists and politicians, 
chirurgeons and curators, delegates and dons, novelists and nutcrackers, who have adorned the traditional theme with every art. Now, I'm afraid that my presentation this evening will be found to contain enough material for several orations, so that the treatment of any of its aspects will necessarily be inadequate. And some of you may share the alarming experience of a certain British financial advisor to the government of Egypt who was invited to dinner by a pasha. Being the owner of an invalid stomach, he politely requested that only one course be served. And only one course was served, an enormous whole roasted lamb, which when carved was seen to be full of large chickens. The chickens in turn were full of quail and the quail in their turn were seen to be stuffed with smaller birds. If a man die, shall he live again? Some who wear their longing after immortality like a garment are laid confounded with all unutterable abortions amongst reeds and nilotic mud, and no man knoweth to this day of their sepulcher. Others reject the offered crown, and one recalls the symbolism of Herodotus' story of Hippocleides, who was chosen to marry the daughter of the king. But at the prenuptial feast, he stood on his head and drunkenly waved his bare legs in the air. You have danced away your bride, they told him, and he replied, what care I? One recalls, too, the symbolism of France imprisoning all that was mortal of Oscar Wilde in an immense granite sarcophagus. But the pathos of his own words will endure long after rock has crumbled to dust. Society as we have constituted it will have no place for me, will have none to offer. But nature, whose sweet rains fall on unjust and just alike, will have clefts in the rock where I may hide and valleys in whose silence I may weep undisturbed. She will hang the night with stars so that I may walk abroad without stumbling and send the wind over my footprints so that none may track me down to my hurt. She will cleanse me in great waters and with bitter herbs make me whole. Remembering Wilfred Trotter's warning that a memorial frequently not so much commemorates as distorts, so that inevitably we drift increasingly away from the actuality of the man, how shall we perpetuate the heroic name? Shall we perpetuate it in an eponymic lecture? But Sir Robert Hutchison could think of better ways to honor the dead than by boring the living. And it is prudent to remember that frequently an eponymic lecture does not commemorate and honor the dead, but advertise the living. <coughs> you are familiar with the story <coughs> <coughs> of Sir Erasmus Wilson, who was advised by Thomas Wackley, editor of The Lancet, to forsake surgery and to link himself so closely with dermatology that whenever he entered a room, all those present 
would start scratching themselves. <laughs> he took the advice and made a fortune. Fifteen years before his death, <coughs> he founded at the Royal College of Surgeons of England the Erasmus Wilson Chair of Dermatology, of which, with becoming modesty, he made himself the first occupant, and which, with becoming modesty, he occupied for seven years. <coughs> Shall we commit an anachronism and perpetuate the heroic name in a commemorative plaque? <coughs> Not so... <coughs> <clears throat> Long ago, the London Hospital thus immortalized one of her sons, William John Little, on the wall of the Red Lion Inn at Allgate. Now, if you have a drink or two or three at the bar, you may hear the ghost of that orthopedic pioneer whisper in your ear, if you seek my monument, do not look around you. <laughs> Shall we perpetuate the heroic name on a postage stamp to enlighten and entertain the young and the young in heart? In the transcentennial year of his death, William Harvey was philatelically honored not by the land that gave him birth, but by the union of Soviet socialist republics. Would it be in order, sir, to inquire where Dixon Wright was at the time? <laughs> <coughs> shall we, as gastronomes, shall we perpetuate the heroic name by serving it at table? At the outbreak of the Seven Years' War against England in 1757, Antoine Augustin Parmentier joined the pharmaceutical corps of the French army and, taken prisoner, had to live on a potato diet almost entirely. He became a national hero in 1785 when the French corn crop failed and the spectre of starvation raised its ugly head. At that time, the potato was used in France almost entirely as cattle fodder, and some people believed that it caused leprosy. Parmentier showed that it would grow in the poorest soil without special care, and he made it the bread of the people. To this day, potage Parmentier keeps his memory savory. <laughs> Beside their real tombs, some have found empty and honorary sepulchres. <clears throat> the medical student, notoriously as an iconoclast, incapable of being taught hero worship, a rare gift bestowed by the jealous gods in utero. It is inevitable if eponyms, the art of medicine being long and time fleeting, are gradually becoming less and less fashionable. But why is it that, you wouldn't appreciate the point as a physician, sir, why is it that in surgery, eponyms, only those eponyms seem to survive which commemorate bad operations? The cutlery of surgery bears many an honored name. I wonder if that most versatile man of our generation, our friend Geoffrey Keynes, knows that he has found a premature grave in a transfusion needle which he invented half a century ago. <coughs> it is a poor act of homage no less than misdirected energy to credit a man with a discovery made by someone else. Take, for example, Lister sounds. Lister sounds are called Lister sounds because they were invented by Syme and they are 
metallic bougies and not sounds, otherwise the eponym is perfectly correct. <laughs> I wonder how Lister would have reacted to that ghastly eponym, Listerism. One can almost smell the pungent odour of carbolic acid. And yet this eponym, measuring, bespeaking as it does, the measure of his services to humanity has entered the permanence of all the languages of all the lands based by the waters of the seven seas. Speaking of Lister, the more elderly among you may recall that in the Lister centenary in 1927, an address broadcast by Sir Barclay Moynian, as he then was, the silver-tongued orator, not only of his profession, but indeed of his generation. Whenever Moynian spoke, men would say that it was Lord Rosebery risen from the dead. Perhaps, Moynian said, a multitude of people listening to me tonight bear upon their bodies the scar made by a surgeon who has operated upon them for appendicitis, for a tumor, for a deformity, for any one of a hundred ailments. That scar is the caress of Lister's hand. Now, some men durst not acknowledge their own graves. I wonder if Lister would deny his own caress, were he able to see the appendectomy keloid with which I was decorated by the army in the last war. <laughs> Some eponymous pastures will forever remain green fields of immortality. A few continue to charm both the ear and the eye. Who would not prefer the zonule of Zin to the ciliary zonule, the serene and tranquil remoteness of the island of Ryle to the insula, the enigmatic darkness of the cave of Retius to the previcycal space, and who would be so foolish as to speak of the fasciculus mammalothalamicus instead of the bundle of Victor Zia, an aristocrat resplendent even in the grave. Some eponyms there are to which few would object and none would aspire. Those honoring a man who was the first to describe a disease, not only for the first time, but in his own person. I remind you of Julius Thompson, the Danish physician, who in 1876 described myotonia congenita, Thompson's disease, in five patients, himself and his four sons. When striving judiciously to keep a man alive, respect his individuality. Do not posthumously hyphenate Argyle Robertson and some of the other people who suffer from a hyphen after their death. But it so happens that medical students do not even respect a man's sex. Would Sir John Rose Bradford dare acknowledge his own grave were he to hear a candidate tell the examiner that the Rose Bradford kidney was invented by a distinguished English lady physician? <laughs> if ever it was to be my fate that I should be burdened with an eponym, let it be one whose usage would enable my colleagues 
to save their valuable time when writing a case history or a case report. How much simpler to write Leishman or a monosyllabic name like Bet instead of a complicated polysyllabic chemical formula. I cast my bread upon the waters. <laughs> you and I, sir, are fond of the expensive things in life. We do not care to join a queue in quest of a bargain. We would not care to associate our names with a disease in the face of greedy competition. You are familiar with the fact that there are four diseases bearing the name of pick and that it is a different pick for each one. <laughs> of all monuments, the most pleasing and at the same time the most enduring is the anatomical eponym. As long as there are students of medicine, Sir Frederick Treves will be remembered as an excellent surgeon, especially in peritonitis, <laughs> or should it be except in piles, what an epitaph to strive for. <laughs> Let us next study two anomalous monuments whose death we should daily pray for. There was a distinguished army surgeon and administrator whose name I should piously refrain from revealing, but he is enshrined in the annals of the Royal Army Medical Corps as Fornicating Freddy. <laughs> what an epitaph to strive for. Army officers notoriously are peripatetics, here today, gone tomorrow. Freddy was no exception. <laughs> and whenever Freddy was transferred to another station, the plumber had to be called in to attend to the lavatory drain, which was blocked solid with not disused razor blades, but something else. By that time, Freddy was busy elsewhere. Some men are remembered solely for their malapropisms. And thus, a certain Minister of Health for Salon, whose name I shall remain from mentioning, Lord Solby will remember him vividly, has become a legend before his time. On a sanitary tour of inspection, he was greatly disturbed by the lack of suitable public conveniences. And he complained, not only were there not enough urinals to go around, but they also needed more arsenals. <laughs> it is the old, old story. <coughs> <coughs> the iniquity of oblivion blindly scatters her poppy and deals with a memory of men without distinction to merit of perpetuity. Who can but pity the founder of the pyramids? Herostratus lives that burned the temple of Diana. He or he is almost forgot who built it. My oration is nearly ended, and those of you who still remember the title may well ask with Roy Campbell, but where's the bloody horse? <laughs> in the flower of his youth, strong in wind and limb, he lived out his day, and now he lies here. <coughs> A pathetic, silly little poem written by Hadrian and inscribed on a noble tomb at Apt in the Provence, where lies buried his favorite hunter, Boristhenes. <coughs> Ironically, his own epitaph over his mausoleum in the Eternal City has long disappeared. It is futile, and this is really the point of my story, it is futile to reconcile monuments and ashes. 
I tell thee what, Hal, if I tell thee a lie, spit in my face and call me horse. The candle is mortal, it burns itself out. Those who toy with the serpent of Epidorus in the land of the shadow of death agree, and when they talk of graves of worms and epitaphs, know the fate of their bones. They agree with Seneca of old that death that ends all, often comes as a boon and has been a favor to many. At this festive, though scarcely pompous or even solemn occasion, we conjure up before our mental eye an image of the man who was the passing of the fugitive years has grown to Olympian stature. We see the incense floating around him, see the halo polished brighter and brighter by adoring hands. And we see some who have made unto them graven images of the man before which they worship and fall down. If, for a brief and beautiful moment, you, Sir William Osler, could come back to us and could see the memorials we have made of you in our profession and in our hearts, what would be your thoughts? Seeing again the spires of Oxford in the early misty blue of a summer morning, unearthly in their haunting beauty, would you approve of the scientific spirit that has invaded the teaching and practice of medicine in the wards of the infirmary which bears Ratcliffe's name? But your eyes would light with pleasure on the commemorative plaque at number 13 Norham Gardens, now the home of a successor of yours in the Regius Chair. In the bosom of this, the friendliest of all medical societies, the largest of all medical families, were the crowned heads, the elder statesmen, the veterans and the recruits of your profession sit side by side as they celebrate your birthday in happy mood. I can see you standing among us and I can hear you whisper, Lord, keep thus my memory green. My Lord, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> I'm sure you will now understand why I refer to Dr. Bett as notorious. <laughs> Dr. Bett has an eponym. Bett's minutes are well known in this club. <laughs> and I think as long as this club exists, Bett's minutes will not be forgotten. The subject of this evening's oration was Adrian's horse. And Dr. Bett reminds us that Adrian, the mausoleum of Adrian, has been forgotten. But surely he's forgotten that Adrian is immortal now, for he, the mausoleum of Hadrian is now the Castello San Angelo. He is now raised among the angels and is immortal. His horse may be with him there. <laughs> 
we've listened to the most erudite oration. And Mr. Oslerian Orator, we thank you very much indeed. And I call upon Mr. Dixon Wright to propose a vote of thanks. Mr. President, uh, Orator, my Lord, the Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I rise with some pleasure to further what our President has already said, that this oration was probably looked forward to more than any other oration has been looked forward uh, to. I know I should not end uh, a, a sentence with a preposition, <laughs> because that is something up with which I cannot put. <laughs> didn't see how to get out of it that time. <laughs> we had uh, a wonderful demonstration of Dr. Betts' powers tonight, and uh, some of us possibly are still a little in doubt about the horse. <laughs> but we all enjoyed, especially his last few words of tribute uh, to the great man uh, around whose feet we gather. And uh, those words that he addressed to him uh, would, I'm sure, if he could speak to us now, uh, would have elicited a whimsical response. Dr. Bett is portrayed in uh, his youth in the menu. And it was a great inspiration of Franklin uh, to do this. I'm sure both of them must feel a little depressed to see how they looked uh, 34 years ago. <laughs> I imagine these two were the mainsprings of this club uh, which has grown uh, to such dimensions that there are now 275 members. Dr. Carline uh, looking for more and endeavouring to turn the club into a society. Dr. Vett had, uh, was a bit of a stormy petrol when he was in this club and he used to uh, vent his collar in uh, C-H-O-L-E-R, in different uh, directions. And he was in and out from time to time. He's a touchy, choleric individual, but invariably comes back to the full. I was very nervous tonight uh, when raspberries were served. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologised to him, and he said he didn't mind them before the oration. But afterwards, they might have had uh, some, some uh, connotation. We're very glad he's made this journey across the Atlantic, and we hope he'll continue to do so. He's come further uh, than any other orator has done in the history of this society. And we're grateful to him for the long journey he's made to speak to us once again and bring us back the memories of the days uh, when he acted as secretary at this society. We're all glad to see him looking well. He doesn't look 90% uh, as congested as he used to look. <laughs> His complexion's clear. You want to see my tongue? <laughs> and he's given up a good deal of his smoking. And uh, his... Uh, Abdominal weakness stands up very well uh, to his smoker's cough. <laughs> and a lot of his talk tonight was on tombstones and epitaphs and so on, a thing he's uh, never ceased to do since he got over the operation upon which I performed upon him. As he was going under, he spoke of nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
and as he came round, he continued to do so. <laughs> but tonight we've had a, a, a memorable oration, and lots of names were mentioned, many of which were unknown to us. <laughs> and uh, the, a recording has been made and will probably be, be played again. Uh, in many a part. It is our intention uh, to send it to the Oslerian Club in South Africa. As you know, Osler had a South African connection. And uh, the club there numbers uh, uh, 269 less than the club in London. <laughs> They have six members, but they're expecting a seventh along at any moment uh, now. <laughs> oh, I feel greatly in my duty, and really uh, I ought to be on my toes after what I've received tonight, uh, to uh, make it plain uh, to Dr. Bett. Uh, this society were very glad when he made his transatlantic journey and came back once more to the fold. When he left in 1959, uh, we all said he'd be back soon. And uh, now he's returned, and he is his old self, and he brings back to us the memories of those days when he dominated uh, this club. He'd like to do it again, and <laughs> we'd like him to do it to us. He used to draw up the program, describe the previous meetings, with an unerring lack of skill of, of, of <laughs> <laughs> and veracity, and uh, uh, we enjoyed it all. He was a great master of punctilio, and he never was late, and he never allowed anybody to go over his time without protesting about it in the minutes. In fact, he was very disappointed with any speaker who kept to his time because it deprived him of a subject <laughs> for criticism. Well then, it is a very great pleasure, one that I shall always remember the fact that the President has been so kind to me as to allow me uh, to say these words in admiration uh, for Dr. Beck. He is uh, one of these people that are getting scarcer and scarcer on the face of the earth. He's a character. And the world is wonderful, uh, very, very short of them. So much so, I like to see some school started to make characters <laughs> or some grants from the medical council to turn an ordinary fellow uh, like any one of us into a character <laughs> in order to make the world more enjoyable uh, for the rest of us who are not characters. One character to every 200 would make the world a very enjoyable place <laughs> and life much more unpredictable than it is. Now, there are lots of drug firms in the world, and uh, medical officers seem to drift uh, uh, from one uh, to another with the greatest e of ease. Uh, Dr. Bett presides over uh, a, a, a journal known as the Proctoscope. <laughs> or, or the Spectrum, it's something uh, of that nature. <laughs> or Spectrum. <laughs> but he could do just as well in this country, and we feel that one day he'll return and we'll have the spectacle of him smoking and talking at the same time uh, with, with great uh, serenity and ability. Dr. Brett, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your memorable and much looked forward to Auslerian oration of the year 1962. Thank you.